Welcome back. Today, we're unpacking Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference, a masterclass in the art of negotiation. Discover the hidden power of no, the secrets of tactical empathy, and why mirroring can be a game changer. Ready to negotiate like an FBI hostage negotiator and uncover the unexpected black swans in any deal? Let's dive in. Chapter one, the new rules. In an age where everyone has access to vast amounts of information and traditional negotiation tactics are taught in every business school, there's a need to distinguish oneself from the pack. Traditional negotiation strategies, deeply rooted in pure logic and rational thinking, have been the go-to for decades. However, there's an evolving understanding that negotiation isn't just a game of numbers and data. Emotion and psychology are now recognized as central to many decisions, making them pivotal in negotiations. John, a Harvard-educated business negotiator, had always been the star of his firm. Armed with an analytical mind, he approached every deal with data, statistics, and logical propositions. Success had been his constant companion. Then he encountered a deal with Nextech, a rising tech powerhouse. Their CEO, Maria, was a different breed. Instead of getting tangled in John's graphs and profit projections, she emphasized the emotional impact of the deal, the cultural resonance for her team, and the broader vision of her enterprise and society. Each logical point John presented was deftly redirected by Maria to focus on emotional or psychological aspects. John, unprepared for this tactic, felt outmaneuvered and out of his depth. Consider you're trying to persuade a coworker, Alex, to collaborate on a project. Logically, teaming up seems like the best option given the complementary skills you both possess. However, Alex is hesitant. Rather than overwhelming him with more data on why it's beneficial, you decide to delve deeper into his reservations. In a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, Alex shares past negative experiences with partnerships. By addressing his emotional concerns and assuring him of clear communication throughout, you're not just offering logical reasons but also tapping into his emotional world. This empathetic approach might just be the key to winning him over. The negotiation landscape has witnessed a seismic shift. It's no longer sufficient to rely solely on traditional methods. Emotions, feelings, and the human psyche have taken center stage. Recognizing this change and adapting to it is what differentiates successful negotiators from the rest. Principle number one is balancing heart and mind. Emotions and logic are both pivotal in modern negotiations. Chapter two, be a mirror. In the complex dance of human interactions, there exists a simple yet profound tool that can bridge gaps, foster understanding, and open doors to deeper conversations. This tool is mirroring, the act of reflecting back what someone just expressed. It's more than just parroting words. It's about resonating with the speaker's emotions and intentions, making them feel genuinely understood and prompting them to reveal more. Sarah, a therapist, often had clients who found it difficult to express their deepest emotions and traumas. During one session, a young man named Tom hesitated to speak about a painful memory. Instead of probing with more questions, Sarah simply echoed his last statement with a gentle inquiry in her tone. You felt lost. Tom paused, looked up, and seeing the non-judgmental reflection of his feelings in Sarah, he began to unravel his story with more depth, comforted by the fact that he was truly being heard. Imagine you're having coffee with a friend, Lisa, who's going through a tough breakup. She starts by saying, it's just, I thought he was the one. Instead of jumping in with advice or sharing a related story of your own, you mirror her sentiment. You really believed he was the one? This prompts Lisa to delve deeper into her feelings, perhaps uncovering layers she hadn't even vocalized to herself yet. In this space, she doesn't need solutions. She just needs to be heard and understood. In an era where genuine listening is a rare commodity and people often feel unheard, Mirroring stands out as a beacon of understanding. It's a simple gesture, but its ripple effects in fostering connection and trust are profound. Principle number two is reflect to connect. Mirroring facilitates deeper understanding and encourages open communication. Chapter three, don't feel their pain, label it. Empathy is a powerful tool in human interactions but there's a fine line between immersing oneself in someone else's emotions and becoming overwhelmed. The chapter introduces a transformative approach. Rather than diving deep into another's emotional world, 
it's more effective to recognize and articulate those emotions. By labeling the emotion, we not only show understanding, but can also diffuse potential tensions and negative feelings, paving the way for more productive dialogues. Imagine David, a manager in a multinational firm, was confronted by an irate employee, Karen, who felt she was consistently overlooked for promotions. Instead of getting defensive or lost in the whirlwind of Karen's strong emotions, David calmly responded, it sounds like you're feeling frustrated and overlooked. By labeling her emotions, he immediately saw a change in Karen's demeanor. Her stance softened as she realized her feelings were acknowledged. This simple act of recognition allowed the subsequent conversation to shift from confrontation to collaboration, discussing tangible steps for Karen's career development. Think back to a recent family gathering. Picture this. You, along with your extended family, are sitting around the dining table and the topic of vacation spots comes up. Aunt Mary, who is known for her strong opinions, passionately argues for a beach vacation, recalling the fantastic times the family used to have by the sea. Uncle Jack, on the other hand, insists that the mountains offer a refreshing change, especially given the sweltering summer. The atmosphere becomes charged as both parties present their arguments. You, sensing the rising tension, decide to employ the labeling technique. Turning to Aunt Mary, you say, you seem to have fond memories of our times at the beach and believe it's a place where everyone can relax. To Uncle Jack, you comment, it feels like you're looking out for everyone's comfort considering the hot weather. By labeling their emotions and underlying concerns, you shift the narrative. The table, which was on the verge of splitting into camps, now nods in agreement. Aunt Mary and Uncle Jack, feeling acknowledged, might now be more open to a compromise or even considering alternative vacation plans that cater to everyone's desires. In the intricate dance of human interactions, where emotions can either become barriers or bridges, the power of labeling stands out. It's a subtle technique, but has the potential to transform confrontations into conversations and misunderstandings into mutual respect. Principle number three is articulate to navigate. Recognizing and labeling emotions can steer conversations towards understanding and resolution. Chapter four, beware yes, master no. The word yes is usually perceived as an affirmation, a green light, signaling agreement and alignment. But in the realm of negotiation, a hasty yes can often be a smokescreen, hiding true intentions or reservations. This chapter flips conventional wisdom on its head, positing that there's immense power in navigating towards a no. A no can provide clarity, establish boundaries, and ironically, can create a platform where genuine agreement can be built. Imagine a seasoned real estate agent, Rachel, was trying to close a deal with a potential buyer, Mr. Thompson. Every property she showed him was met with a, yes, this looks nice, but weeks went by without any solid commitment. Rachel decided to change her approach. Instead of seeking affirmation, she presented a property slightly outside his specified preferences and asked, this isn't what you're looking for, is it? Mr. Thompson responded with a firm no which opened a candid conversation about his actual priorities and concerns. By directing him towards a no, Rachel was able to hone in on what he truly wanted. Now imagine you're trying to organize a reunion with college friends, and while everyone seems excited, pinning down a date becomes elusive. Everyone says yes to the idea, but there's no progress. Instead of proposing more dates, you take a different approach. Is everyone too busy for a reunion this summer? This question angled towards a no might make your friends reconsider their commitments and prioritize the gathering, finally settling on a date that works for all. In the world of negotiations and interpersonal interactions, no isn't a door closing. It's often a window opening to clearer communication and deeper understanding. By mastering the art of no, one can pave the way for genuine commitment and agreement. Principle number four, no is a beacon. Steering towards no can illuminate the path to true alignment and understanding. Chapter five, trigger the two words that immediately transform any negotiation. Negotiation at its core isn't just about reaching an agreement. It's a dance of understanding, acknowledgement, and validation. While many phrases can be exchanged during a negotiation, there are two words that when uttered by the other party signify a turning point. That's right. These words are more than just an agreement. They convey a deep resonance and acknowledgement of a shared perspective. 
Imagine Sophia, a project manager, was in a meeting with stakeholders discussing project timelines. The clients, a dedicated team from a tech startup, were pushing for tighter deadlines. As the conversation became tense, Sophia took a moment to lay out their concerns as she understood them. You're under pressure to launch before the big tech conference, and you believe our current timeline puts that at risk. After a pause, the startup CEO responded with, that's right. Those words shifted the dynamics of the meeting. With a shared understanding in place, the two teams collaborated more effectively to find a workable solution. Let's say you and your partner are having a disagreement about weekend plans. You want to visit family, but your partner seems reluctant without stating why. Instead of pushing your agenda, you decide to summarize their possible feelings. You're worried that if we spend another weekend with my family, we won't have quality time together, right? Your partner's eyes meet yours as they reply, that's right. With those two words, the underlying concern is out in the open, creating a foundation for a more constructive conversation. In negotiations, and even in daily interactions, the power of that's right cannot be underestimated. It's a testament to true understanding and can turn adversarial exchanges into collaborative conversations. Principle number five is validation's victory. Eliciting a that's right bridges gaps and fosters collaboration. Chapter six, bend their reality. In the intricate theater of negotiation, the landscape is not solely shaped by cold, hard facts. Instead, it's the nuanced interplay of perceptions molded by diverse psychological triggers that often dictates the unfolding drama. This chapter elucidates how adept negotiators harness a repertoire of tools to craft the narrative. One, anchoring, setting a reference point that calibrates subsequent negotiations. Two, loss aversion, leveraging our innate fear of losing to make propositions more compelling. Three, deadlines, using the ticking clock to introduce pressure and urgency. Four, the fair word, utilizing the profound psychological weight of fairness to sway discussions. Five, accusation audit, preemptively addressing potential negatives to neutralize their impact. Six, prospect theory, exploiting the human tendency to favor certain outcomes over uncertain, potentially greater ones. To provide a deeper understanding and practical application of these tactics, we will dissect each one, presenting them as individual key principles. Through this segmented exploration, I aim to equip you with a holistic toolkit for bending reality in negotiations, ensuring you're not just heard but truly understood. 6.1. Anchoring Ascendancy. Anchoring in negotiation terms refers to setting an initial benchmark or starting point that serves as a reference for subsequent discussions. The power of this tactic lies in its ability to steer the course of negotiations based on that initial anchor. If used effectively, even an extreme anchor can make subsequent offers seem more reasonable by comparison. Picture this. Alice is a real estate agent preparing to list a luxury penthouse in a posh neighborhood. Knowing the power of anchoring, she sets the initial price at a whopping two million. Prospective buyers are taken aback by the high price, but it sets a tone for the discussions that follow. When Alice later drops the price to 1.6 million, the property suddenly seems more reasonable, even if it's still on the higher side. Buyers feel like they're getting a deal in comparison to the initial price, and negotiations proceed with that anchor in mind. Imagine you're at a local flea market, eyeing a vintage lamp that would fit perfectly in your study. The seller asks for $100. You counter with an offer of 40. The 40 isn't just a random number, it's an anchor designed to pull the seller's subsequent counteroffer lower. The seller might come back with 75, and suddenly a midpoint negotiation around 60 seems fair to both parties. The initial anchor of 40 has successfully steered the negotiation in your favor. Whether we're talking about million dollar real estate deals or bargaining at local markets, anchoring plays a pivotal role. Setting that initial reference point strategically can heavily influence the trajectory of the negotiation, ensuring you have a favorable ground to tread. Principle number 6.1 is Anchoring Ascendancy, Setting Initial Benchmarks to Steer Subsequent Negotiations. 6.2, Loss Lure. The fear of losing something, whether it's tangible like an object or intangible like an opportunity, is deeply ingrained in our psyche. This principle, called loss aversion, dictates that the pain of losing something is usually perceived as more intense than the pleasure of gaining something of equal value. 
Skilled negotiators can leverage this to frame propositions in a way that makes them seem too good to pass up. Jonathan, a seasoned car salesman, understands the power of loss aversion. When a couple walks into the showroom eyeing the latest sports car, he doesn't just highlight its features. Instead, he mentions that it's the last car available at the promotional price and hints that another customer was considering it earlier. The mere thought of missing out on this opportunity, combined with the allure of the car, compels the couple to make a decision on the spot. Think of those limited time offers you see online. Only three items left at this price, or sale ends in two hours. These are perfect examples of tapping into our fear of missing out. Next time you're trying to convince a friend to join you for a concert, mention how tickets are almost sold out, or it might be the last tour of that artist. This not only creates urgency, but also makes the opportunity seem more valuable. Loss aversion isn't just a concept reserved for high stakes negotiations. It's a daily dance we all partake in, sometimes without even realizing it. By understanding and harnessing this innate human fear, one can make propositions that are hard to refuse, be it in business or personal life. Principle number 6.2 is loss lure. Utilizing our biological predisposition to fear loss, making our propositions irresistible. 6.3, deadline dynamics. Deadlines serve as potent tools in negotiations, introducing an element of time pressure that can motivate parties to act. The ticking clock, whether real or perceived, can break deadlock situations, spur decisions, and when used strategically, tilt the balance in favor of the one wielding it. Marina, a business consultant, is negotiating a lucrative contract with a potential client. After weeks of back and forth, both parties are close to an agreement, but a few sticking points remain. Recognizing the need for a nudge, Marina sends an email stating that due to upcoming commitments, she can only honor the discussed terms if they finalize within the next 48 hours. This sense of urgency pushes the client to compromise on the remaining points, leading to a swift closure of the deal. Ever noticed how productivity surges right before an assignment's deadline? That's the power of deadline dynamics in action. When planning a group vacation, if decisions about dates and destinations are dragging, set a soft deadline. Tell the group that flight prices are expected to rise after the weekend, so decisions need to be finalized soon. This often catalyzes discussions, and decisions are made quicker. Deadlines, whether looming large or subtly hinted at, have a profound impact on our decision-making processes. They instill a sense of urgency, pushing us to act, decide, and sometimes even concede. By understanding the dynamics of deadlines, one can maneuver through negotiations with a unique advantage, ensuring discussions progress with purpose. Principle number 6.3 is deadline dynamics, harnessing the power of time constraints to instill urgency. 6.4, fairness factor. The concept of fairness is deeply rooted in our psyche. We all have an intrinsic need to believe that we're being treated fairly and that our actions are justified in the context of fairness. In negotiations, invoking this notion can influence the course of the conversation, fostering goodwill and ensuring that both parties feel acknowledged and respected. Leo is a manager trying to negotiate a new contract with a supplier. Instead of aggressively pushing for the lowest price, he starts by acknowledging the quality of their products and their long-standing relationship. He expresses his desire for a fair deal that would be mutually beneficial. This framing makes the supplier more receptive and they're willing to offer better terms than if Leo had approached with a combative stance. Imagine you're trying to split the cost of a group gift for a mutual friend. Some members of the group think the price is too high while others are okay with it. Instead of insisting on your perspective, Frame the conversation around finding a fair contribution for everyone. Highlight the importance of everyone feeling comfortable with what they're chipping in. This way, the group is more likely to arrive at a consensus that everyone deems fair. The notion of fairness transcends cultures, age groups, and situations. It's a universal currency in the world of negotiation. By understanding and invoking the fairness factor, one can foster trust, pave the way for mutual understanding, and facilitate smoother negotiations, ensuring both parties walk away feeling respected. Principle number 6.4 is fairness factor, employing the psychological potency of fairness to guide negotiations. 6.5, audit approach. 
In negotiations and discussions, potential objections or negatives can be stumbling blocks. However, by addressing these negatives proactively, an approach known as the accusation audit, you can disarm the other party, create an atmosphere of transparency, and shift the narrative towards more productive dialogue. Emily, a real estate agent, is showing a house to potential buyers. She knows that the house is priced slightly above market due to its prime location. Before the buyers can raise the issue, she mentions, you might feel this house is a tad overpriced. However, its proximity to schools, parks, and the downtown area adds a premium that many families find worth the investment. By addressing the price concern up front, Emily neutralizes a potential objection and refocuses the conversation on the property's unique value. Suppose you're presenting a project idea to colleagues, but you're aware of certain shortcomings. Instead of waiting for someone to point them out, take the lead. Begin by acknowledging the drawbacks, followed by strategies to mitigate them, or reasons why the overall benefits outweigh these challenges. This proactive approach not only showcases your thoroughness, but also guides the discussion towards constructive feedback. Anticipating and addressing potential negatives doesn't show weakness. Instead, it displays foresight and control over the narrative. By employing the audit approach, negotiators can steer conversations in their desired direction, cultivating an environment conducive to understanding and cooperation. Principle number 6.5 is audit approach, preempting and neutralizing negatives to set the stage for positive discourse. 6.6, .6, prospect play. The prospect theory posits that people make decisions based on the potential value of losses and gains rather than the final outcome. Intriguingly, they often lean toward a sure smaller gain over a potentially larger, but uncertain, one. Recognizing this cognitive bias can be instrumental in molding negotiation strategies, offering insights into the counterparty's likely choices. Robert, a car salesman, presents two financing options to a buyer. The first guarantees a modest discount with standard financing rates, while the second offers a chance at a significantly larger discount but depends on a game of chance. Despite the allure of a potentially bigger savings, most buyers gravitate toward the guaranteed discount, a testament to the pull of certainty over uncertainty. Imagine you're organizing a fundraiser. Instead of merely offering potential donors a chance to win a lavish yet uncertain prize, also provide an option of a smaller, guaranteed token of appreciation for their contribution. You might find that many prefer the certainty of the immediate token over the prospect of the grander, uncertain reward. The intricacies of human decision-making often revolve around the dance between certainty and potential. By understanding the prospect play, one can better anticipate choices, tailor offers, and navigate the delicate corridors of negotiation leveraging the human predilection for sure outcomes. Principle number 6.6 .6 is prospect play, tapping into the human inclination to prefer certain outcomes, even when faced with potentially greater uncertain ones. Chapter six, summary, the psychology of negotiation. The act of negotiation isn't merely about crunching numbers, terms, or putting forth tangible offers. It's a delicate psychological dance and understanding human tendencies can decidedly tilt the scales in one's favor. The Bend Their Reality chapter unpacks six pivotal psychological instruments, each providing a distinctive avenue to influence, guide, and traverse the intricate maze of negotiation. Imagine you're Jordan, an entrepreneur, in the throes of a challenging business merger, drawing from your negotiation toolkit, you. Set clear goals, anchoring. Establish a solid starting point, setting the tone and trajectory for subsequent discussions. Highlight benefits and stakes, loss aversion. Emphasize the unique advantages of your proposal and the opportunities that might be missed if not seized. Introduce timelines, deadlines. Apply subtle pressure by proposing a realistic yet firm timeline for the merger's completion. Emphasize equitability, fairness. Position the deal as being in the best interest of all involved parties, ensuring mutual benefit and fairness. Anticipate and address concerns, audit approach. Tackle potential downsides head on, assuaging any reservations the other party might have. Leverage certainty, prospect play. Present certain immediate benefits of the merger as opposed to potential uncertain future gains. With this multifaceted approach, rooted deeply in psychological strategies, 
You navigate the merger talks with precision, ensuring an agreement that harmonizes with both parties' instincts and preferences. In summarization, negotiation, at its heart, is an art form as much as it is a science. By keenly understanding and wielding key psychological triggers, anchoring, loss aversion, the pressure of deadlines, the draw of fairness, preemptively addressing issues, and the preference for certain outcomes, you can traverse the negotiation landscape with amplified finesse and insight. The key principles of chapter six. One, anchoring ascendancy, setting initial benchmarks to navigate ensuing negotiations. Two, loss lure, exploiting our innate aversion to loss to make offers resonate. Three, deadline dynamics, deploying time constraints to foster urgency. Four, fairness factor, leveraging the universal appeal of equitable treatment. Five, audit approach, proactively addressing potential issues to steer the narrative. Six, prospect play, capitalizing on our inclination for definite immediate benefits. Mastering these six principles opens the door to a more informed, psychologically attuned approach to negotiation. Chapter seven, create the illusion of control. Negotiation often feels like a tug of war with each party vying for control. However, the most successful negotiators know that real power lies not in overt dominance, but in subtlety. The chapter, Create the Illusion of Control, provides a masterclass in the art of using calibrated, open-ended questions. These aren't merely tools for information gathering. They're strategic devices designed to give the other person a sense of control, all while steering the direction of the conversation. Julia, a seasoned real estate agent, is showing a house to a couple who seem hesitant. They've expressed concerns about the neighborhood, although they love the property itself. Instead of directly addressing their worries or pushing the home's positive aspects, Julia turns the conversation by asking, what features are you specifically looking for in a neighborhood? The couple begins to list their desires, parks, cafes, schools. Julia, recognizing this as an opportunity, replies, what if I showed you a nearby area with all these amenities? Would that make a difference in your decision? The couple, feeling in control and validated, agrees. By the end of the day, they're discussing potential offers, all because Julia skillfully created an illusion of control. Imagine you're attempting to persuade your roommate, Alex, to adopt a cleaning schedule. Instead of dictating terms, you might begin with, how do you think we can keep our place more organized? Or what days work best for you to handle certain chores? By framing the conversation with these questions, Alex feels an active part of the solution, not just someone receiving directives. The result? a collaborative environment, and a higher likelihood of consistent cleanliness. Whether it's in high stakes negotiations or everyday interactions, the ability to make others feel in control while you guide the direction is invaluable. It fosters collaboration, reduces resistance, and often leads to more fruitful outcomes. Principle number seven is guided autonomy, using calibrated questions to steer dialogue while granting others a sense of command. Chapter eight, guarantee execution. Effective negotiation doesn't conclude with a mere agreement. The real success lies in its execution. The path from an agreement to its actual implementation can be strewn with unforeseen obstacles and misunderstandings. But there's a simple yet potent tool in the negotiator's arsenal that can bridge this gap. The how question. It goes beyond surface level commitment compelling the other party to think through and articulate the practical steps for execution, thereby solidifying their commitment. Marcus, an event planner, is working with a new supplier for a major corporate event. They've agreed on the decor, delivery timelines, and costs. However, having faced issues with suppliers in the past, Marcus knows the importance of ensuring seamless execution. Instead of just sealing the deal, he asks, how will you ensure everything arrives in the designated setup locations, given the tight turnaround between events at the venue? The supplier, now prompted to think through the logistics, outlines a detailed plan. This not only gives Marcus added assurance, but also encourages the supplier to be more accountable. Imagine you and a friend are planning a weekend getaway. You both decide to share responsibilities. Instead of assuming your friend will remember everything, you inquire, how do you plan on managing the food supplies for the camping trip? By asking this, you're prompting your friend to think about the specifics, such as shopping lists, quantities, and dietary preferences. 
making it more likely that nothing essential will be overlooked. Whether in business negotiations or everyday arrangements, prompting with the how question can be transformative. It navigates the conversation from mere commitment to a space of clarity, preparation, and heightened responsibility. Principle number eight is the how advantage, transitioning from agreement to actionable commitment. Chapter nine, bargain hard. Bargaining is an art, one that's painted with the brushstrokes of strategy, psychology, and persistence. Whether it's a high stakes business deal or haggling in a local market, the principles remain consistent. And while bargaining can sometimes feel confrontational, it's crucial to remember that it's simply a dance of value exchange. This chapter lays out a strategic approach to ensure you always get the best deal possible. Setting targets. Before diving into the thick of negotiation, it's paramount to set clear targets. Knowing your desired outcome, the ideal price or term, gives you a north star to guide you through the negotiation process. And with this clarity, you'll determine your initial offer, one that's aggressive enough to set the tone. The Ackerman Model An advanced bargaining method derived from the high-risk world of hostage negotiation, the Ackerman Model offers a structured way to methodically reduce the other party's demands. One, start aggressively, open with a lower or higher, depending on the situation, initial offer than what you actually aim for. Two, three decreases. Use calculated steps to get closer to your target. First, decrease by half of the difference, then by 65%, and finally by 85% of the original difference. Three, fine tune with a minor increase. This makes the other party feel they've squeezed almost everything out of you. Four, conclude with a non-monetary item, offering something extra, which doesn't significantly affect your bottom line, can seal the deal and make the other party feel they've won. Pivots and the power of adaptability. Not every negotiation will follow a script. When faced with unexpected offers or resistance, don't push blindly towards your initial target. Instead, pivot, adapting your strategy to the dynamics of the conversation. React with the flinch. A genuine visible reaction to an unexpected term can be powerful it signals your discomfort, prompting the other party to reconsider their stance. Precision with odd numbers. Use non-rounded numbers in your offers. Their specificity can make them appear well-researched, giving them more weight. Beyond money, non-monetary offers. Remember, value isn't just monetary. Introducing non-cash terms can make an offer more attractive without affecting your core objectives. Ticking time and deliberate pauses. Use time as an ally. Deliberate pauses or drawing out negotiations can exert subtle pressure, making the other party more eager to close. Clarity through reiteration. Once you believe you've struck a deal, restate the terms. This ensures mutual understanding and minimizes future disputes. Liam, the founder of a rapidly growing tech startup, was in negotiations with a software vendor, Cloud Solutions, to purchase an enterprise software package for his team. Cloud Solutions began by quoting a price of $15,000 for the software package with a year of basic support. Drawing upon the lessons of setting targets, Liam had already determined that his upper limit was $12,000 with the hope of getting extended support. But knowing he needed to start aggressively, he opened his counteroffer with an assertive $9,000. This was met with surprise from the vendor, which Liam detected and responded to with the flinch feigning deeper shock at the vendor's initial quote. After some back and forth, Liam deployed the Ackerman model. His next offer was $12,000, the halfway mark. The vendor hesitated but countered with $14,000. Liam's next move was a pivot to $12,650, calculated to be 65% of the difference. Throughout the process, Liam used precision with odd numbers, making his offers seem calculated and well-considered. When Cloud Solutions came down to $13,500, Liam made a smaller increment in his counteroffer, quoting $12,975, inching closer with an 85% reduction of the difference. To add depth to the dance of negotiation, Liam utilized the principle of beyond money, non-monetary offers. He mentioned how his startup had significant reach in the tech community and proposed promoting Cloud Solutions on his company's widely read blog. This, he asserted, would be a win-win, offering value beyond the immediate transaction. As they neared an agreement, Liam introduced ticking time 
and deliberate pauses. He mentioned he had another meeting with a competing software vendor the next day, subtly pressuring Cloud Solutions to close the deal promptly. With the vendor now eager to finalize, they made a counteroffer. The software for $13,200 with extended support for two years. Liam, sensing the deal was close, added one final touch from the Ackerman playbook, a fine tune with a minor increase. He proposed $13,225, but asked for three years of premium support and a dedicated representative for any issues. Cloud Solutions, feeling they had squeezed almost everything out of Liam and attracted by the non-monetary benefits, agreed. After shaking hands, Liam made sure to execute clarity through reiteration. He summarized the agreed terms, $13,225 for the software, three years of premium support, a dedicated rep, and a promotional article on his company's blog. Both parties left feeling they had secured a beneficial deal. Bargaining isn't about being the loudest or the most stubborn. It's about being strategic, adaptive, and understanding the multifaceted nature of value. By employing a mix of targeted techniques, from the Ackerman model to the power of odd numbers, you'll be equipped to navigate any negotiation landscape with confidence. Principle number nine is strategic bargaining, using a blend of tactical techniques to ensure you always secure the best possible deal. Chapter 10, find the black swan. In the intricate world of negotiations, not everything is as it seems. Just as a black swan event in finance or history is an unpredictable outlier with significant impact, there are always undisclosed or overlooked factors in any negotiation. Factors that, once revealed, can radically change the trajectory and outcome of the discourse. These black swans can be vital pieces of information, hidden motives, or unforeseen variables. To identify them, a negotiator must possess not just shrewd observation skills, but also the ability to ask incisive questions that get to the heart of the matter. Maya, a city planner, was spearheading a project to revamp the city's Central Park. The bidding process had been competitive, with numerous companies vying for the contract. The leading contender, Greenscape Designs, had a solid proposal, but was asking for a significantly higher budget than the city had allocated. During the negotiation process, Maya, sensing there might be underlying reasons for the higher quote, decided to dive deeper. She asked open-ended questions, encouraging the representatives from Greenscape to elaborate on their vision for the park. After some prodding, it was revealed that one of the senior designers at Greenscape had grown up in the city and had fond memories of the park. Their proposal included several intricate features inspired by historical elements of the park, aiming to restore its former glory, a detail that hadn't been highlighted in their written proposal. This piece of information, the emotional and historical connection of the designer was the black swan. Recognizing this, Maya shifted her negotiation strategy. She expressed appreciation for the designer's personal connection and proposed a collaboration with the city's historical society to co-fund the restoration aspects of the project, reducing the financial burden on the city's budget. Greenscape, appreciating that their unique vision was recognized and valued, agreed to adjust their costs for other elements of the project. The deal was struck, with both parties feeling understood and valued. Now imagine that you're trying to buy a vintage car from a private seller. The price seems a bit steep, so during your discussions, you ask more about the car's history. The seller reveals that it was the first car his father bought after immigrating to the country and holds a lot of sentimental value. Understanding this black swan, the deep emotional attachment to the car, you acknowledge its importance to the seller. Instead of haggling aggressively, you propose a slightly reduced price, but also offer to share stories and photos of the car's adventures under your ownership, ensuring its legacy lives on. The seller, touched by this gesture, agrees. In any negotiation, the overt factors are often just the tip of the iceberg. Beneath the surface lie the black swans, unseen, unspoken elements that can make or break a deal. A successful negotiator knows the value of keen observation and the right questions, ensuring no stone is left unturned. Principle number 10 is Swan Searcher, discovering the hidden game changers to shape successful negotiations. Wrapping up our insights from Never Split the Difference, it's clear that the realm of negotiation is deeper than most imagine. 
With tactics like mirroring, the calibrated question, and the art of tactical empathy, you're now equipped with strategies to navigate even the toughest negotiations. Harness these tools and see how they transform your interactions. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you never miss an update. And if you liked what you saw, a like would mean the world to me. It helps support the channel and lets me know you want to see more content like this. Thanks again and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.